Okay, I just got it that I'm recorded. And uh, the consumption of textiles in Bronze Age Greece and the new evidence uh, for the so-called technical textiles. I will explain this term, uh, later on. That comes from textile imprints on the undersides of clay ceilings. This evidence, as well as other relationships between textile production and seals and selling practices, have been examined within the um, research project titled Textiles and Seals, Relations Between Textile Production and um, uh, Seals and um, uh, Selling Practices in Bronze Age Greece, that has been funded by the National Science Centre of Poland for the years um, 2018 uh, 2021. So it should have been accomplished by now, but due to the COVID and all the uh, restrictions, uh, it has been prolonged until at the very beginning of this year. As suggested by the title, the main objectives of the Textiles and Seals project focus on revealing the structure and meaning of relationships between textiles and textile manufacturing and seal and sealing practices uh, so far unnoticed in textile and seal studies. These relationships can be tracked by analyzing imagery of seals and textile production related iconography on Aegean seals, seal impressed textile tools and a more general practice of marking textile tools by impressing seals and other objects on them, incising or even inscribing the tools and imprints of textiles and other organic products that were used in sealing practices as a means to store, type, wrap, or hang the sealed objects, and which will be discussed uh, in a more detail today. The main types of evidence, altogether numerous, feature different functionalities, qualities, and parameters, and they reflect various processes and practices. Therefore, the collected evidence has required different manners of recording and scheduling of different research queries. These are facilitated by the open access SQL database designed and built online, especially for the project, by the Digital Competence Center of the University of Warsaw, our technological partner. Although our knowledge of textile production and economy in Bronze Age Greece has increased enormously over the last two decades, as summarized in very recent 2021 report by Bela Dimova and Margarita Gleba, excavated textiles are relatively rare finds due to the environmental conditions in Greece, which are unfavorable for preserving organic materials. The majority of preserved textiles survived in the funerary context, often in association with metal objects or due to carbonization like at Akrotiri. Textile imprints on clay are yet another form of textile preservation. This limited evidence of extant textiles, which should ideally be the primary source of evidence, is supplemented by several important indirect sources, such as textile tools being found abundantly at archaeological sites, remains of textile workshops, such as dye works, faunal and botanical remains suggestive for raw materials, and visual evidence textual sources, primarily Linear B tablets and experimental archaeology and ethnographic sources. Each type of evidence requires different methodologies, such as macroscopic, microscopic and scientific analysis of the preserved textile fragments, contextual and functional analysis of textile tools and workshops, experimental archaeology, but here understood as a method, and iconographic and textual analysis. Uh, the available evidence allows to characterize textile culture or cultures in Bronze Age Greece. However, the picture we have obtained is rather static and anadiachronic developments are hard to track, especially through the preserved textile fragments. Common for all Aegean cultures of the Bronze Age were 
use of flux and wool as the main raw materials. And this is um, attested by excavated textiles as well as the textual evidence, splicing and spinning in a drop spindle technique with a low whirl. And this is attested again by excavated textiles and also by tools, spindle whirls. And wide use of the warp weighted loom since the Neolithic, albeit with substantial regional differences with regard to the moment of its introduction and the preferred choice of loom weights and presumably fabrics. The maps show differences in dispersion of discrete loom weights and spools in the middle to early late Bronze Age. Um, uh, phase, which implied preferences for different types of textile tools and perhaps different weaving techniques as suggested by spools. Other common features are exclusively chubby weaves attested by excavated textiles regardless the period and region, purple dyeing industry possibly starting somehow with the end of the early Bronze Age on Crete, attested by recent finds of archaeological textiles from Stamna and zoarchaeological evidence, as well as pigment analysis, and the existence of multicolored pattern textiles attested by iconography, but not much seen as yet in actual textile remains. Major developments can be seen in growing importance of wool economy since the early Bronze Age, the spread of the purple dyeing, transmission of discoid loom weights and techniques which accompany them to the southern Aegean, and successive increase of the scale and organization of textile production. Obviously, textiles were not only clothing, although clothing, especially the one which we know from iconography, is indeed visually appealing. There are several classifications of textile products that illustrate the scale of textile consumption in a given society. And the one presented here is a modified scheme adopted from the publication of Mary Harlow and Marie Lily from 2014 and Karina's grammar book uh, from 2015. What I like about it is the division for, um, uh, between the first hand textiles and the second hand textiles. So we have so called first hand textiles. And and these are textiles that were produced for specific purposes, and they obviously comprise clothing, but also various accessories such as sashes or belts, maritime textiles with sails, which were products of the utmost um, economic importance, and cultic and funerary textiles such as votive offerings or shrouds, household textiles such as rugs and wall hangings, doormats, and technical textiles. All these products were used and subjected to modifications, repairs that were subjected to use were, and given the high value of textiles in all prehistoric societies, they were recycled to yet another series of products, such as, for example, stuffing and caulking material, rags, hygiene products, but also cultic and funerary textiles again. From the variety of textiles that were in use, a very limited number of extant textiles has been preserved, and these are most exclusively, uh, nearly exclusively, the funerary and technical textiles. So we finally come to this term. Technical textiles is a term that has recently been promoted by Johanna Bankbergers in relation to the excavated textiles from the Neolithic and Bronze Age wetland settlements in southern Germany. It serves as a terminological umbrella that covers a range of various products used for tying, wrapping, fixing, hanging, storing, etc. It comprises textiles, that is, products made of flexible elements in variety of techniques, as well as basketry, wicker work, and even leather products such as thongs. Although the precise definition is still missing, this is a very useful term, or perhaps rather a concept, to describe a large part of perishable material culture that was produced using textile and alike techniques, and that was used in a similar way. 
according to my knowledge, the largest collection of the preserved technical textiles, including the ones shown on the slide in the gray scale, um, come from the modern casts of the undersides of clay settings stored in the archive, the Corpus de Menauschen und Mechanischen Siegel in Heidelberg. This remarkable collection is currently being analyzed as part of my research project, Textiles and Seals, with that AMS as the key research partner. Casts of the selected undersides of clay ceilings have been systematically taken by the TAMAS team over the years. The basic information about these casts can be found in the TAMAS volumes and the by Hafta, as well as in the TAMAS Arachna database, uh, in the search engine for surfaces containing seal impressions, but here I'm referring to the old version of Arachna exclusively. However, the textile imprints on the Samas cast have not yet been examined in full, and the Textiles and Seals project provides the first comprehensive attempt of um, examining all of them systematically. My special thanks go to the director of the archive, Professor Diamantis Panagiotopoulos, who made this collection available for my studies and agreed to present my research results, as well as many Tamas drawings and photos in the Textiles and Seals database. Obviously, the presence of impressed threads and cords, as well as baskets, mats, leather tongues, and even a few woven fabrics have not remained unnoticed. For example, Legible impressions of technical textiles were occasionally suggestive for techniques and raw materials, as for example, the imprint from Fustos on the slide, interpreted by Andrika Fiandra as a reed matting woven with palm leaves. And she made also an observation on the nature of cords impressed on other Festus ceilings. Detailed and systematic considerations on raw materials impressed on the undersides of clay settings, comprising studies of the reference samples of modern raw materials, have been conducted by Walter Miller and Inga Pini. Standard textile analysis with identification of the structure of the impressed textiles, either woven fabrics or cords and threads, are however fewer. Textile imprints from Yerak in Laconia were published by Judith Weingarten with textile analysis provided by Julian Fogelskank Eastwood, a renowned specialist in Egyptian textiles. And I show on the slide a super interesting fragment, which most likely um, preserves the starting border, which is the beginning of a textile woven on the warp weighted loom. Structure of several cords from Lerna has have been analyzed by Maria Costula uh, in the footnote of her and Josef Marin's 2014 paper. While structure of threads impressed uh, on um, flat-based nodules from Akrotiri have been analyzed by Sofia Vakirzi, Raula Jorma, and Artemis Karnava in the 2018 paper. Perhaps a few words about what is the basic textile analysis uh, may be useful here. It is usually made using a Dynolite digital microscope and depending on the type, it provides the magnifications from circa 20 times to 300 times or 500 times and a useful software allowing taking certain measurements. The magnification itself allows more detailed examination of the impressed textiles. And here I'm showing again the CMS cast from Festos, where we can see additionally to Fiandra's matting, a textile impression forming a bulb over the s plate cord. We can see more clearly the structure of the raw materials impressed and the technique in which this mat or rather basket was produced, but whether they were reeds or palm leaves, it's another question which I will also discuss in a minute. The standard textile analysis provides information about the construction of threads, whether they are final products or parts of fabrics, and threads which are parts of fabrics are called yards by us, cords and ropes. 
Uh, quartz, uh, threads, and ropes are conventional terms uh, that we use uh, to classify products according to the diameter. So quartz are uh, classified as products of diameter from two to eight millimeter, and all below this range are threads and all above it are ropes. We measure diameter of single and plied threads and coats, twist angle and twist direction of each element. Twist direction is conventionally expressed by S and Z letters, since these letters recall graphically the appearance of the twisted product. Capital letters refer to the twist of compound products. Here, the capital S is indicating that actually all quartz on these slides were S applied, while the number and the following small Z letter here on this slide, on this picture, uh, refers to single elements that were applied together. We also identify weave, possible use wear and decoration, and the density of fabric, which is characterized by the number of warp and weft threads counted per a centimeter of a textile. Let me show you now how these data, data are transferred to the Textile Census database and how they are visualized in the search engine of the model with textile impressions. Since according to my knowledge, this model publishes online the largest existing collection of Virgin textiles with so far 225 casts, 225 casts and possible uh, and possible impressions of 32 threads, 170, uh, 127 cords, 181 textiles, and 62 other organic products. The manner of presenting the data has been a true challenge. The data fields are grouped into three categories. These are fields identifying the object, fields identifying impressed seal or seals, and those identify and identifying textile impressions. The search engine allows single and multiple queries and queries with or disjunction, as well as an export to Excel files. Each uh, record display all faces of seals that were impressed on the front side of the ceiling, a photo of the TMS cast, and dynolite photos of each identified type of textile impression. Additionally, a short description provides information about threads count, if applicable and possible to estimate, and the basic construction, whether it was single or plight, and respectively, what is the twist direction, twist angle, and diameter for single and plight products. If more measurements were possible, a range from the minimum to maximum values is displayed. If there is only one measurement, it goes as a minimal value. Detailed information about the data and search engine can be found in database description and user instructions pages, as well as in popping up help windows. So far, we collected data come from Ayatriada, Hania, Knossos, Malia, and Festos on Crete, Lerna and Geraki on the mainland, and the islands of Kea and Lemnos. Fully recorded are the data from Lerna with 52 casts, Yeraki, eight casts, and Festos, 145 casts, while the comprehensive study of textile impressions on all casts in the TMS archive is to be continued. Understanding the alternations resulting from impressing textiles on clay and identification of raw materials are, to me, the biggest challenges for studying textile imprints. Legibility of each impression is related to various factors, such as properties of raw materials. For example, harder plant fibers leave more clear impressions. Elasticity and free dimensionality of textile products, as well as specific sealing practice. For example, when the sealing was taken off when the clay was still wet, as well as finally the preservation and property of clay fabric. Dimensions and twist angles of threads and cords are altered 
due to deformations of a textile resulting from pressure on wet clay and a stamped seal. And there is also the process reverse to that one, which results from the shrinkage of wet clay. According to my experiments, these deformations result in both larger and smaller dimensions or measurements as compared to actual textiles in a maximum difference of 33% between the diameter of yarn measured from a textile and its negative imprint. But obviously these experiments have also uh, have always uh, been um, considered in relation to the very specific clay fabric. On the TMS cast, twist direction remains unaltered since the cast document positive copies of textile impressions. Identification of raw materials is perhaps a more serious challenge. As for the previous identifications, I found it difficult to understand what specific features in the microstructure of the impressed textiles were chosen to define the raw materials and how secure these identifications could be given the structural similarity of various plant fibers and the variety of procurement techniques. This slide illustrates such similarities among modern samples seen under microscope, including fibers of different origin, such as nettle and deer sinews, or pig guts, and for example, ratted lime past. In order to make the identification of vegetal and animal origin materials more systematic and less subjective, I have decided to develop a protocol roughly adjusted to the evidence from the CEMAS costs. The protocol required the compilation of yet another reference collection of modern samples and their experimental impressing on clay. This collection comprises a selection of fibers that might potentially be available in Bronze Age Greece, but it also seeks for differently procured raw materials of the same origin. It documents potentially diagnostic features such as section, ending, and use well. However, it has to be stressed that none of the modern collections can document all the raw materials available in a specific geochronological context of the past. They were simply too numerous. Ideally, if all the diagnostic features were preserved on impression, the protocol could aid uh, in the identification of a specific type of fiber, although not a specific species of plant or animal. Unfortunately, several features, especially ants, sections, and siuswa, are rarely preserved on textile impressions. Moreover, many of the distinguished features reveal possible similarities amongst various types of fibers, and therefore, in my opinion, it is not possible to recognize the origin of raw materials on imprints in a reliable way. There are exceptions to this, such as Russian weaker, horsehair, leather, and fur or fleece, since their diagnostic features are more unique and perhaps more prominent. As a result, I have decided to use this protocol to propose a broader classification of materials and to distinguish groups that share similar diagnostic features, but can comprise variously procured fibers of different origin. These groups are named after the type of raw material only if they clearly display its characteristics, such as wicker-like and leather tongue like material groups. Otherwise, the terms have been chosen according to the most prominent features visible on the surface and in the microstructure. Long strands of fibers group is characterized by tightly aligned fibers and a smooth surface of long, narrow, or broader strips with a relatively high relief in the microstructure. Diagnostic features suggest plants of fibrous with fibrous stems, such as um, a flax, uh, hemp, or nettle, which were processed um, in that way that um, their appearance results uh, in strips, bulrush, and tree bust, but perhaps also guts as, as possible materials. 
Broad strands of fibers are characterized by broad band-like strands of fibrous microstructure, which suggest entire stems of plants, for example, barbrush, possibly tree bust, and even grasses or palm-like leaves. Long individual fibers are characterized by smooth or coarse surfaces with long twisted or loosely twisted fibers seen individually in the microstructure, which suggest fibers from variously procured plants with fibrous stems, such as mentioned above, uh, flax, nettle, and hemp, and possibly sinews, although um, Fibers of sinews of deer that I have examined are much finer than the ones um, from the Tsema's impressions. Short individual fibers are characterized by loosely aligned and loosely twisted individual fibers uh, with single fibers of um, various diameters protruding in the microstructure. And these are seen as as until now, only on two casts, um, one uh, from uh, both from Vestas and the one uh, 693 is not so clear. Uh, perhaps um, the one uh, 920 is um, better showing um, uh, characteristics of this group. Diagnostic feature for the first time suggest animal origin fibers such as wool and goat hair and also fibers from fibrous stems, possibly processed from dried stems. Oh. Although the proposed identifications are not specific, the distinguished groups imply diversity of raw materials used to make technical textiles and diversity of techniques of their procurement. This slide shows the comparison of raw material groups recognized on imprints from Lerna and Festos. The majority of Lerna clay settings, classified by Marta Heath into six types, come from the House of Tiles, a large corridor house of public function dated to the end of the early Hellenic II period. The protopalatial site of Festos produced the largest preserved collection of direct object ceilings from the Aegean Bronze Age. Most of them were recovered from a layer in room 25 uh, that has been dated to the middle Minan to be destruction of the palace. The typology of individual sealed objects have, um, has been proposed by Enrica Fiandra, who suggested that these ceilings were possibly attached to only 16 different objects, opened and closed repeatedly over a relatively short period of time as a part of a perhaps daily routine. Despite all sociocultural differences and time and space separating Festos from Lerna, similar objects secured um, by technical textiles such as bags or knobs of the doors and chest sides, jar coverings, baskets and mats were subjected to sitting practices at these two centers. However, there is a notable difference in the number of technical textiles preserved at both sites with 52 casts of textile impressions from Lerna and 145 casts from Festos, as I have already mentioned. If we look at the charts showing the distribution of particular material groups, the group with long strands of fiber of fibers um, is dominant at both sites. At Lerna, next go the group of broad strands and weaker. At Festos, products made of broad strands of fibers and long individual fibers were preserved in the same numbers, while long individual fibers constitute only 4% of all materials at Lerna. Weaker-like products are preserved in the same numbers, yet they constitute only 8% of the preserved evidence uh, from Festos. Interestingly, uh, no leather products have been attested at Lerna. Overall, the variety of raw materials used and presumably the techniques of the procurement were higher at Festos. 
Imprints of fabrics until now have been generally unnoticed, but they are indeed difficult to be discovered by macroscopic examination. The impressions are often very flat or crumpled, and the patterns of the occurrence is rather surprising. They can appear as indicated by red arrows on jar coverings, which is not very surprising, but also in between weaker sticks or matte elements at the sides of the packs, above, under, and beneath the impressed cords, and on surfaces perpendicular to the packs. Sometimes they can even be found on wooden poles. Observed patterns of textile occurrence require further examination, including experimenting. My working hypothesis that has to be tested is that some imprints may have reflected accidental impressions of fabrics in the sealing process. So they are perhaps impressions of the textiles that wrapped the clay used for sealings in order to keep it moist. The thread count has been estimated for 40 textiles and textile -like structure and uh, structures, and it ranges from 20 to 80 threads per centimeter. For most of the textiles, that is 29 examples, the thread count falls into a narrower range between 30 to 50 threads per centimeter, exceeding therefore the thread count attested at excavated textiles. Yet it has to be remembered that the original measurements must have been altered in the process of uh, impressing um, uh, textiles. There are only uh, there is only one possible example of a decorated textile so far. It comes from a covering from Vestas, and this is open tabby weave of a net-like appearance, possibly a thicker thread indicated by a series of red arrows on the slide, was inserted in equal intervals into this weave, and we can see it perhaps also here. Uh, as um, and um, yeah, it's I mean its structure uh, uh, suggests a special technique for making uh, this sort of regular decoration. Several textiles and textile-like structures feature more prominent impressions of single threads, often of a loose-like appearance, like in here. Uh, this might suggest that the impressed textiles were worn, perhaps used for a long time or recycled as technical textiles to be exploited in storing and selling practices. Now, uh, let us have a look at the qualities of threads and cords used in selling practices at Lerna and Festos. Uh, at Lerna, all 40 uh, cords that were preserved are as plied and they were drilled, spun or cabled with just one example that is um, Z cabled and S plied. And for this example, I'm not quite sure whether this Z cabling appearance is actually cabling or if this uh, cord was just twisted together for tying the sealed object. Diameter is measured for 37 cords from Rena and one cord like product. It ranges from 2.41 to 7.03 millimeter for the cabled example. Out of those 30 cords, which is 81% of cords with the measured diameters, falls into a smaller cluster of values from three to five millimeters, suggesting some technical and possibly practical homogeneity of cords used for tying at Lerna. From Fistos, we have threads, thread to cord products, and these are products uh, of minimal uh, or minimum diameter, which falls into the thread category and the maximum diameter, which falls into the cord uh, category. And um, with this group, uh, we have six plied cords, and uh, these are both Z and S plied products. We have 13 single threads, which were uh, S, Z, uh, twisted, and we call it I twisted, which means that they were not really twisted, and two possibly braided cords, or not cords, threads, uh, excuse me. 
Diameter of threads ranges from 0.12 to 1.87 millimeter with nine threads, which is 40% of this uh, collection of diameter below one millimeter. So quite thin indeed. 82 cords um, demonstrate a much bigger variety than the ones from Lerna. And uh, they um, uh, include 72 S plight and 10 Z plight cords, and seven that were possibly braided. Diameter is measured for 77 cord, cords, and it ranges from 2.05 to 6.05 millimeter. Out of those 62 cords, which is again 81% of the cords with the measured diameters, falls into a smaller cluster of value and a smaller cluster of values as compared to the cords from Lerna, which is from two to four millimeters. That again suggests some technical and practical homogeneity of cords used for tying at Festos. Again, Products used for tying at Festos were more varied in terms of their construction. So we have S and Z plight threads and cords and possibly braided products. And overall, cords from Festos were also finer or at least thinner than the ones from Lerna. The distinguished production techniques are adjusted to the nature of textile imprints on the Tzema's cast. For example, uh, there was no attempt to recognize how yarns were made in woven fabrics, where they spliced, which is quite likely, or spun, since the impressed uh, microstructure of yarns was not clear enough for such identifications. Threads and cords used for tying are most frequently identified as span drill or cabled, since to me it was impossible to recognize whether they went spun with a spindle or drilled by hand, nor I could exclude that some of the plied cords were actually cabled, that is, plied more than once. At Lerna, the most frequently attested technique is weaving, represented by 45% of individual impressions with recognized production techniques, including dubious identifications. Then go spinning or drilling, 32%, and techniques which suggest matting, basketry, and wicker work, representing altogether by 12% of impressions. The two main techniques, that is weaving and spinning or drilling, are also the most frequent at Festos with 50 and 30% of impressions, respectively. However, at Festos, technical textiles were produced using techniques unknown from the evidence from Lerna, such as skin processing, 7%, and possibly braiding, 4%. Twining, matting, or weaving, together with basketry or matting and wicker work techniques, um, uh, could have been quite similar, uh, and they actually might have been done in um, using very uh, alike techniques. But um, they have features that um, I would like to distinguish in my classification. Still, uh, this like perhaps artificial variety uh, of this um, basketry and matting related techniques um, implies more varied products at Festos where they are altogether represented by 9% of individual impressions. Interestingly, cords and cord-like products made of loosely twisted fibers are slightly more frequent at Festos, but again, it should be remembered that the evidence from Festos is also more numerous. To conclude, the Temas archive collects unique and numerous evidence for technical textiles that were used in storing and sitting practices in Bronze Age Greece. Texas and Seals project provides the first comprehensive attempt for examining all the casts and publishing them online in the open access Texas and Seals database. This database is also an efficient tool for further examination of these imprints, even though it is still not complete. 
a statistically significant number of textile imprints allows for the first time to make site-specific comparisons of textile production on the basis of the products. On the basis of textile imprints, raw materials can be identified as groups of impressions sharing similar characteristics rather than specific plant or animal origin fibers. The discussed evidence from Lerna and Festos implies the more varied raw materials, products and production techniques were in use at Festos. This in turn may imply diachronic developments of textile technology. Regardless the observed differences, there is a certain technical and possibly practical homogeneity of technical textiles used in sitting practices at these two sites. Finally, studies of textile impressions on the TEMAS cast open a series of new research questions such as recognizing individual hands in the manner of wrapping and tying the sealed objects, identifying textiles that were possibly used more than one time in sealing practices, or perhaps even identifying how many objects were indeed subjected to sealing practices at a specific site. Finally, uh, finally, finally, publishing all textile impressions uh, online, and um, I estimate that there are still hundreds of them which require examination, will um, form an open access corpus of Minan and Mycenaean technical textiles. Before I will end, I would like to say that all this research would not be possible without the excellent team of the Textiles and Seals project with uh, Marie-Louise Nausch and Olga Krzyszkowska, whom I thank very, very much for their help, inspiration, feedback, and patience. And to PhD student interns, Katarzyna Żebrowska and Kinga Pigoraj. And I have to say special thanks to Katarzyna Żebrowska, who still continues to be the part of this project, although her last scholarship was paid in March last year. I would also like to thank uh, very much uh, the CMS team, Professor Diamantis Panagiotopoulos, but also Dr. Maria Anastasiadou, who introduced me practically to the archive. And this was really a fascinating experience. And special thanks are due to the CKC, that is Digital uh, Competence Center of Warsaw team, for their great and deeply mutual collaboration on the database. Its last modules for, module for sealed, impressed, and marked textile tools is nearly ready for the publication, and it is being now tested by us, and hopefully it will be published um, next week. I welcome you all to the website of Textiles and Seals Project for more information. I hope that the database will work as it should, because to my horror, I've seen some problems with it uh, yesterday, but all those problems were fixed by noon today. And um, the website um, has also the outreach page with um, the list of publications resulting uh, from this project. And I thank you very much for your attention.